Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness and seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And we've pretty much come to the end of chapter 1. I want to spend some time in this video reviewing what we've seen in chapter 1. And then we'll move on to chapter 2. And uh, so we may not get very far in chapter 2, but I think it's important that we take a look at what we've seen so far. Uh, I just want to take a moment to wish everyone out there a happy Veterans Day. Uh, a couple of things before I actually get started on this, on the review here. Uh, it may or may not be a good idea to jump ahead a little bit, but uh, we are going to see, I believe, here in our study, Shortly, we're going to see the uh, church in heaven. And uh, from our study in Paul's epistles, we, we know, at least it's the position of this channel, this ministry, that there's, there are two comings. There are, there's the rapture of the church and then the second coming of Christ, both of which have to do with clouds that we are caught up at the rapture in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And when the, our Lord returns at the second coming, He returns in clouds. And I've, been, I've spent some time looking at uh, that uh, a little closer. What I find interesting, I just wanted to put this out here for you to think about. It's, it's, it's amazing to me. It's always been amazing. In fact, it's been one of the, the hallmarks of this channel that we look at things that are a little out of the ordinary, but that uh, seem to be have significance, mean, uh, uh, a significant meaning or uh, uh, even a, an exciting uh, uh meaning when it comes to symbolism in the Bible. And when you look at all the references to clouds, it's, it's not hard, it's not very difficult to see that, that clouds represent God's divine presence. Uh, God appearing uh, to Moses on the, on the mount, uh, the Israelites in the wilderness, the the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, the Rapture, the Second Coming, etc. And what I find interesting about it is when we look at the process by which clouds are formed, uh, just uh, every day you folks, uh, normally, depending on I guess where you live, but just about every day you, you'll be able to look up and see a, a, a a lovely white fluffy cloud floating in the sky across the sky. And of course, I, as believers, it's, it's very tempting on our part to look at everything from a biblical perspective and look at everything as having meaning. Uh, there is a process by which these clouds form. Uh, the, the sun's light the, is shines down on the waters of the earth, the lakes, the streams, the ponds, the you know the oceans, and uh, the uh, that evaporation rises of water droplets and ice crystals, and they, so they rise into the air uh, to form clouds. And what I find interesting about that is that when we look at that process in which they're formed. And if we look at the sun above our head that gives us life and light, if we look at that as the sun, S-O-N, which e there's even a, a verse in the Bible that relates the sun, S-U-N, to the sun, S-O-N, 
and we look at the light as truth, and we take all, all of this imagery, these, this, these, the symbolism, and we, we go strictly by the, the biblical definition of, of those symbols and what they represent. Light represents truth. The waters of the earth represent people. Uh, the, the air uh, represents the, uh, the heavens. It's one of the heavens. It's the, uh, uh, and what, so what we're looking at is the suns, and I'm talking about Christ here, His light, His truth, shines down on us, on the earth's waters, that is the people, and it rises into the air, the heavens, to form clouds, to form that which represents His divine presence and glory. And I find that interesting. I just want to pass that along. It doesn't really have anything to do with our present study. There's another thing I want to bring to your attention, and that is uh, the judgment seat of Christ, which occurs after the rapture. We know from Scripture that we are rewarded. We also know that we cast our crowns at His feet. Uh, and we see that that in Revelation chapter 4. We'll see that when we get to chapter 4. And that's before the first judgment seal is opened in Revelation uh, uh, 5, I believe, uh, or 6, which can't occur until the tribulation begins. Therefore, if you just based upon that, that logic, Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, where we stand before Him and we are rewarded. Uh, that that must occur within a a thirty day gap. We're going to see in this study that the church is in heaven, and events unfold and take place over a some particular period of time. And I, I put time in quotes here at least time from the perspective of those who still are who are living on earth these events unfold there there are events that unfold before the actual uh, first seal is open before the tribulation begins before that judgment period begins if there in my understanding and I don't I don't ask anyone to agree with me I never I never ask you to agree with me on anything but in my mind, if there is no gap, then how could Bema even occur? And so I find that also interesting. So uh, I've got some notes here on my computer here. I've, I've, uh, I hope that I haven't bitten off more than I can chew for this one video, but I want to uh, somewhat review what we've seen so far. far. The revelation of Jesus Christ, that is, uh, that is how the book starts out. This is not a book of something Christ is telling us, okay? But it is a book that deals with the revelation of Christ. It's revealing Christ. The book is revealing Christ. It's revealing Christ in His deity. It's revealing Christ in His majesty and His sovereignty. And uh, most Christians today, at least it's been my experience, that the sovereignty of God doesn't really factor very heavily into their thinking about their walk and their relationship with Christ. But that's what we see. We see that repeatedly. Which God gave unto John to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And I told you that... Uh, uh, there, there's different ways of looking at, uh, at that. If we were living uh, a thousand years ago and we read that, I think it would be wrong to read that as if we were the final last generation. There's been many generations that have come and gone before us who, who have read those words, things which must shortly come to pass, and it's kind of difficult in our finite mind to to reason or rationalize how that the Lord could say such words as that when time has gone on 
continued on for so long? How could it short be shortly come to pass? And what I pointed out was is that what I believe the text is telling us is that when these events start to uh, unfold, when these events start to occur, uh, they are going to, to occur quickly, that uh, things which must shortly come to pass is also to be looked at from John's perspective because uh, he's in a position in writing this to where that, at least from his perspective, these things will shortly come to pass. In verse 8, we saw, uh, we, re we read the words, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Uh, and he says, which is and which was and which is to come. It's interesting, and, I, and I, I don't really have any answer for why. He says, which is, that's present, and which was, now he goes back to the past, and which is to come, now he jumps over the is, you know, the present, into the future. And it's not in order, in other words. It's not in chronological order. But that's what the text says. Which is and which was and which is to come. And in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, we spent some time uh, looking at that. It was, uh, it's the position of, of uh, many uh, commentators, theologians, many believers, many students of prophecy, that well, what that means is, is that he was in the Spirit uh, on Sunday or the Jewish Sabbath. And I pointed out that that is a dative and uh, if it is the dative of location, which I believe it is, then we're looking at a location. And that phrase, Lord's Day, is a very particular phrase that's found quite often in the Old Testament to refer to a period of time which begins after the church has been removed. And he heard behind me, uh, John says, heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, and we see that the, the trumpet, uh, it's, it's quite easy for, for uh, many of us, I believe, to take that, that phrase of a trumpet and just say, well, okay, he's, this is the rapture that we're looking at, and there's no indication in the text at all, at least in my opinion, that this is speaking of the rapture. But, but just what it's saying, just what it's saying. The great voices of a trumpet, uh, which is not uncommon, for those who actually uh, experienced, uh, uh, had a personal experience of, of hearing the voice of the Lord. Verse 11, what thou seest, write it in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And he goes and lists those seven churches. Uh, and I pointed out how I, I find it extremely interesting that, that we've already had seen seven churches in the New Testament. And when you go down and you, you look at the letters that Paul wrote to the churches, we have Ephesus being in the middle. Uh, and it's Ephesus being the only one that's seen in the seven churches here in our study in Revelation. None of the other churches are mentioned. And then we have a description of what, what John uh, saw as far as a description of our Lord in verses 12 through 16. I spent a few, a few moments uh, oh, covering what uh, that and, and what I felt about that, and and how that uh, I tried to make it, uh, make some effort at least to point out to you the fact that that it's it's there's a, often a temptation to look at Revelation, to look at the book of Revelation as something that's difficult, that uh, that many of us seem to. Uh, uh, actually be afraid of as far as far as studying because well it just seems too complicated there's too much uh, imagery there and too much symbolism and and everything and for me to really understand you know revelation so I'm just going to leave that to the experts and uh, and 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 then uh, often we ought, we'll look at some of this sim, this imagery and we'll we tend to want to I guess the temptation is there to, to look at, uh, at what so much more of this means, that there must be some greater meaning uh, behind it than what is, was given. 
I, I don't believe that God is the author of confusion. I, I, I sincerely believe that we're to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. We have to spend time in this book if we're to grow in, in grace and knowledge of our Lord. But I also believe that God has, has not made His Word so complicated that even with some of the worst translations, that God can still reveal His truth to His people, to the, to the, the most, uh, the youngest saint. I mean, uh, even uh, if you were just born again a week ago, we all have the Holy Spirit. Uh, I am nobody's guru. I'm not an expert on these things, and I'm not an expert on this book. And you have the Holy Spirit in you as well to guide you, to direct you. And He said that He He does that. It, God says He does that. And so uh, I'm not concerned so much about you in that sense that uh, that. Uh, and you shouldn't really rely so much so heavily on what on the opinions of others. You know, you read uh, uh, six or seven opinions of others, and you pick one that sounds the best, and you go, "Oh well, I'm just going to go with that." You know, and you don't really spend time in the Word. You know, all of those opinions that you read could be wrong, including mine. That's what I'm trying to say. So we saw a description of our Lord. Uh, I suggested that we take it at face value. This is what John saw. It doesn't need a whole lot of explaining. In verse 17, we read, we read how that John fell down uh, uh, before him uh, as though he was dead. And what I really failed to, uh, uh, in the last mention of that, in the last video, I believe what I failed to touch on was the fact of, of I, I didn't really emphasize very heavily the word dead. Uh, I did say that I believed that we would have fell down as dead as well, that you would have and I would have, but I, I really didn't touch very heavily on the word dead. Why does it say that? Dead. You know, it's, it's uh, we're often, I think many, many believers that read that are probably tempted to, to look at that as something just a little bit scary. The one thing I've never believed is I've never believed that God minces words. I don't think that He uses words without a, a purpose. There's, not a, there's always a purpose and a meaning. He, I, I believe that He chooses His words carefully. And not only that, I believe that because of the fact that John fell down as dead, now it's, it's easy to say, and it's true to say, it would be absolutely 100% true to say that John uh, fell down as dead, and, and we would, you would fall down as dead, and I would fall down as dead, because what, what we're looking at here is the almighty, majestic God who created the heavens and, and the earth, who hung the stars in the sky. So sure, yeah, yeah we're going to fall down dead. But we also know, folks, that we came to know the Lord through a very specific, a very special process in which uh, we were made alive in Christ. And at one time we were uh, totally depraved. We were spiritually dead and we could not hear, we could not receive, we could not believe, or anything else. And there's a lot of imagery in the book of Revelation, and, and I, I'm just really strongly inclined to look at that word dead there as meaning more, uh, there being much more meaning behind it than what appears on the surface. That's been the experience of those who have had a deep insight into God's sovereignty, okay? Falling down dead. His authority, His sovereignty. And when we talk about redemption, it's, it's hard to separate the subject of His authority and His sovereignty uh, when we're, we're 
discussing, when we're discussing the, the subject of the new birth, how that we were spiritually dead before being made alive. And the right hand of authority was laid upon John, and Christ our Lord said, Fear not, and I'm thrilled to death that he said that. Those are such comforting words. They should be to every one of you out there who know and, and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Fear not. It's exactly what he said when he appeared in the upper room. He was, he was the one who became dead. Uh, the, uh, your Bible says it doesn't really bring that out, that fact out, but, but in the original text, he became dead. That that's, has heavy theological implication. And he's alive forevermore. He's not going to die again. But he became dead. It was by, no one killed him. It was, uh, uh, he willingly gave his life. I tried to point that out. I also tried to point out that in verse 18, the keys of hell and of death, we don't hold those keys. <clears throat> I understand there's a lot more meaning behind that than, than that. That our, our Lord overcame hell and death. Probably hell there in death refers to uh, Hades uh, as well as the lake of fire. But we don't hold those keys. In verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, now those, those three seem to be in order. Uh, the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, I believe what we're looking at here is basically the outline and in, uh, of the book of Revelation. I want you to note the similarity uh, of those words. The uh, things which thou hast seen, things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Note the similarity between that and verse 8 where the Lord says, which is, and He's referring to Himself, which is and which was and which is to come. Okay? He's referring to Himself there when He says, which is, He was the one which is and which was and which is to come. And what Paul is writing down are things which he has seen, the things which are and the things which shall be, Hereafter, I, I'm probably failing you miserably, you know, here in, in trying to describe what I see in that. I hardly know how to, to put that into words. The things which thou hast seen, okay? Uh, the emphasis being on the word seen. Uh, so we have a direct correlation between the word seen what, what John had seen, and our Lord Himself. And at the beginning of the book, as I mentioned, it's, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not a book of something about Christ. It's, it's not a, a book of, of something that Christ is telling us, but it is a book that deals with the revelation of Christ. The book is revealing Christ. It's easy to look at Revelation as, well, man, that's Revelation. That's a heavy book, man, and that's a whole lot of stuff. And we see a whole lot of symbolism, and we see a whole lot of events taking place, and we see a whole lot of this and a whole lot of that. Folks, I understand that. But what we're looking at very specifically is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how the book starts out. It is a revealing of Christ. And I don't know how many times I've pointed out, I've tried to point out in previous videos through all of our other studies, through all of these marvelous, wonderful epistles of Paul, how that what we're looking at is Jesus Christ. If, if you pick up the Bible and you look at it as just a, a rule book on, on how to live the Christian life, you're missing the point of, of what it's all about. 
I've mentioned before that I believe that this is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but it is primarily a book, a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing we read in verse 1 of chapter 1. And then I pointed out in verse 20, we're, we're actually told the mystery of the seven stars, which John saw in the right hand, the hand of authority of Christ. The, uh, the seven stars, the seven golden candlesticks, it, it clearly states that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So we have Scripture interpreting Scripture. We don't have to go off looking for the meaning of this. And so we come to chapter 2. We come to chapter 2 where we read that, that he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He walks in the midst of the churches and he holds the seven stars in his right hand. Going back to verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars. Okay? The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And we spent some time, I spent some time talking about how I believe that the, the angel, the word angel, uh, agelion, can mean a human messenger. In fact, if, uh, if you take that as uh, celestial angels, holy angels, we can pretty much eliminate that being fallen angels. Uh, then we have a problem because when we get into the to the looking at the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches, we see that there's some problems. And I, I can't now. Maybe you, you may be of a different mind than me. You may believe that that unfallen holy angels can do things wrong. Uh, that is not my position on that. I can't take it that way. I can't read that that way. So that pretty much eliminates the idea that these are uh, 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 even holy angels. But they have to be, in the word angel, messenger, uh, we see that in Hebrews. I believe we see that in uh, the chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 1, a cloud uh, no, that's that's the wrong verse. Uh, we have a cloud of... Uh, hmm. My mind kind of went blank here for a moment. Uh, we, can, uh, we can entertain angels unaware. I'm not sure where that verse is. Some of you do. Some of you are familiar with that. I believe that to you, you can entertain a messenger of God in the flesh, a human messenger, unaware. That's what I believe. There are instances in Scripture where that the word agelion refers to human messengers. So I, I touched on, I spent a little time on uh, trying to identify the seven churches. Or, you know, who are these seven churches? Uh, there, there are some who... who Relate these actually relate these seven churches to the uh, Old Testament, the uh, in the temple, the uh, uh, seven uh, golden candlesticks, the seven candlesticks. Uh, I don't believe that that's the case. There are those that uh, believe that these are were seven historical stages of the Jewish church in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, they'll, they'll go as far as to say, well, you look at the church in Ephesus, uh, and that kind of relates back to Genesis. There's a lot of, you see a lot of similarities there. And, and so they'll take you through the historical stages of the Jewish church in the Old Testament, uh, and they see that, uh, at least in their mind, they believe that these seven churches, that's what they represent. The problem with that is, is that of which periods uh, uh, 
which historical stages, which periods uh, do they represent? And, and there is no general agreement on that. There are some who believe that these uh, seven churches, they just describe the condition of the seven churches before A.D. 70. Uh, it assumes that Revelation was written before A.D. 70. There's no uh, real strong evidence for that. Uh, the problem with that is that two or three of these churches didn't exist before A.D. 70. Uh, and Ephesus, according to one historic writer, was, was fine. Didn't have any problems. Eph Ephesus was fine until about 103 A.D. And so the date of the writing supports 94 to, I believe, 95, 94, 95, 96 A.D. Now, there are others who say that each of the seven uh, churches here that we're looking at in, in, the, in our study here, that we're about to, to, to look at, each of these seven churches represents stages of church history until today. And that is a, a popular view. And so now we're living in the, the, the later stage, the stage of La the, the period of uh, the church of Laodicea. And uh, I spent some time in thinking of that along those lines, but I, I just ran, I come to run into so many problems with that that I had to pretty much reject that idea, as popular as it is. You know, there are just problems with that. All but one stage would, would uh, of those, if they, if they represent seven particular stages of church history, well, all but one stage would, would possess non-applicable truth. That's for one. Uh, you can go back as far as, as at least in, in, in my reference library, you can go back as far as the 1600s and see that they thought then during that time, in the 1600s, they thought that they were the Church of Laodicea and have every sin, ever since, okay? Well, that's, that's quite a long stage uh, within those seven stages of church history. I don't believe that that's the case. Uh, just to quickly remind you of, of what I believe are possibilities here, I believe that they, uh, they could all, all of them, represent the condition of the church at any time in church history. I don't, I don't, I've had a, I've had very little problem with that. I don't see any problems. I don't see where any problems arise in, in looking at them that way. Uh, that they all represent the condition of the church at any time in church history. There's another possibility, and that is that they represent the complete condition of the church right before Christ raptures the church, right before He comes and returns for us, the body of Christ. That's what these seven churches represent. They represent the complete condition of the church right before He comes for us. And I believe that's a, a viable uh, position. There are those who believe that these are what we're looking at is really churches in the tribulation period. And we know that there will be that. Listen to me, folks. After the body of Christ is removed, don't think for one moment that every single church everywhere, church building, I'm referring to, you know, we are an online church, but I'm referring to actual physical brick and mortar structures. I wouldn't spend much time thinking about the, how the, the, they're all just going to be boarded, boarded up I mean, or abandoned, okay? There will be churches in the tribulation period. There will be churches after the Lord takes and removes His body. There will be those who gather together and they will continue on as a church into the tribulation period. And God does have His chosen, His, His elect in that period. And church, the word church, it means assembly or congregation. That's what the word means. Uh, 
We often use the term church. We often use the term body of Christ. We know that we are the body of Christ. We know that during the tribulation period, those who are redeemed during that period will not be the body of Christ, but they will be redeemed saints. And they will assemble and they will congregate. And that's what the word church means. And as I pointed out, in, I believe in part two or part three, Moses, uh, we have the word church associated with Moses in the Old Testament. Uh, now these messengers, these slash angels, or angels slash messengers, however you want to look at it, I do not believe that when we get into looking at the, the uh, unto the, the angel of the church at Ephesus, right, and so on and so forth, it is, it is not celestial. No, the angel is not celestial, but it is the messenger of that church. And whether that's a, a pastor, a deacon, a bishop, you know, an elder, I believe in any church, folks, there are those that besides the pastor that are associated with that church that are they're standing for something just like this ministry that you we call blessed hope forever it's an outreach ministry it's an online ministry we actually have a, a board of elders that i try to stay in touch with on a regular basis i pro probably a little too much and uh, to the point of annoying them, but you know, I, I've always tried to, to 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 take a brick and mortar sort of approach to this ministry, even though it's an online church, and I take that responsibility very seriously. I believe that this is the message that is being preached unto the messenger of the church at Laodicea, right. Now, now, who that, whether that's, you could take that as a, a, a me, the message that the church is preaching or the messenger himself. I believe that it's, or perhaps it's both. But I believe it is what a church stands for. And some teaching comes from Sunday school teachers and, and elders and women's groups. And, you know, it's the message and, and I, I hope and pray, it's always been my prayer that this ministry, what it stood for was the person and the finished work of Christ in preaching and proclaiming Christ as uh, the gospel and uh, the finished work of Christ. Uh, Christ walks, we see in verse 1, He, he walks in their midst. You know, he not only hears, but he knows the hearts of the hearers. Uh, he holds the stars. You know, stars are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking navigation here, but, you know, he's, they guide, they direct, you know, at least in the navigating sense. And he, and he holds those in his right hand of authority. God is sovereign. Uh, you might ask, well, how can there be problems like in, in Laodicea and Sar Sardis? You know, the Pergamon, you know, how can we see problems if God is in control? Steve, you're, you're always talking about God's sovereignty. I was, he's, he's always in control. God has clearly told us, dearly beloved, that in the latter times, many would depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits. I believe that that's going to be prevalent in the last days. And I don't know how you look at last days. You can look at last days as, as the entire period that's existed from the time Christ ascended until the present. You can look at the last days as, as being well, it's the, we've only been in the last days, Steve, since, uh, uh, since November 3rd. You know, I, I don't know how you look at that. I believe, 
I believe that the last days, that phrase last days is, is, is referring to the final period of church history or of, of, of the history of the redemption of mankind, the, the final period, the, in fact, the, from the time that Christ is, uh, came on the scene uh, and or departed the scene. I believe that we've been in the last days. And folks, it doesn't take very long, and I pointed this out as well, it doesn't take very long for a church to uh, degenerate. Men love darkness rather than light. Uh, if you, uh, I mean, uh, there's many examples I could give of that, but I think what we're going to see as we get into looking at these, we need to first identify who these seven churches are. I believe I've let, given you my position on that. And as we go through this amazing chapter of chapter two and three and four, you know, I, I find it interesting how that, that, it, for those of you out there who are not pre-trib, you, you, you are going to have a very difficult time explaining what we're looking at in the first four, four or five chapters leading up to chapter six, where the, the church seems to, to, to appear but then disappear for the rest of the entire book, which doesn't reappear until later on, close, close to the end of the book of Revelation. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I know we're living in uh, un times of uncertainty. Of course, that's always been the case. It's just in our the few years that we have here, this is our time of uncertainty. Uh, I, I tend to look at that almost as just about every day of our life is, well, you could say we're living in times of uncertainty. But we're certainly living in times of unprecedented uncertainty. And I stand by our timeline for the spring. I, I do believe that there's, I find it interesting that uh, the Jewish custom is that uh, a marriage occur on a Tuesday and that's exactly the day, Tuesday, of the beginning date on our timeline in spring. It, it's just looking more and more like uh, spring 2021 every day. I want to thank you all for all of your continued interest. I want to thank you for your prayers and your direction for this ministry, which strangely, uh, since we've gotten into the book of Revelation, which I was reluctant to do, it appears that if we keep going at the rate that we're going, we will actually complete this study by spring of 21. Now you just take that for however you want, but... Uh, uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about 2021. I've learned from experience that that's never a good idea to, to do that. I'm simply presenting a timeline that I believe is probably the most interesting, the most fascinating, the most intriguing timeline date-wise of anything that I have seen published. That's all I've ever said when it comes to these timelines. I want to thank you for all of your your prayers and and, and concerns and, and the comments, the wonderful comments that you leave me, all of your love, your support, those of you out there who are, have personally taken a hand, uh, taken a hand to this ministry, uh, which I believe are it has it, it in the past, it is and will continue to do, Lord willing reach and touch the lives of believers everywhere. The Lord knows those are His. He knows where they are. And bring them into a deeper understanding of just who they are in Christ. Just how much He loves us. Just how much He cares for us. How much He guides and directs us. How that He, he died in our place. He lives forevermore. He has nothing against us. The sin issue has been settled. We can stand before Him with all confidence and faith and love toward 
one another and Him because we have that blessed hope of what lies ahead in the future. I love you all, I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.